Last class we started learning about the induction type energy meter. In the induction type energy meter we have an aluminum disc pivoted on both sides, so it is free to rotate and uh, on the disc we have two coils producing flux that interacts with the disc, the current coil and the potential coil or the voltage coil. The flux generated by the current coil interacts with the eddy current generated by the voltage coil flux and uh, vice versa that provides a propulsion torque and uh, this torque starts moving the uh, disc and the disc starts rotating. Right. There is another arrangement where we just keep a permanent magnet some distance from the center and uh, when the disc starts rotating there would be an induced EMF because there is the disc itself is a conductor aluminum conductor when it cuts the flux there would be an induced EMF and uh, we all know that when there is a rate of change of flux the induced EMF and hence the current that flows is to oppose the process of inducing EMF. Right. So, it will have a breaking torque and the disc will rotate and stabilize at a frequency omega where the torque that propels the disc and the torque that tries to break the disc are equal. Right. And uh, last class we derived that the omega is some constant times the integral of V i d t. Right. The integral V i comes mainly because we are looking at steady state right d c operation. Okay. The omega may fluctuate a little, but what we are interested in a steady state omega. And uh, we already saw that we if we count the number of disks uh, count the rotations number of rotations the disk makes what we actually do is integrate the speed of the disk. Right. So, which means the count value will be integral omega which will be integral power. So, the final count value that I get would be energy right. and uh, once a meter is designed with the radius of the disk fix, the number of turns in the uh, voltage coil, number of turns in the current coil, the uh, area of uh, the cores of the current coil and the voltage coil, then this constant gets fixed and the constant we normally give in revolutions per kilowatt hour or revolutions per unit of energy because <coughs> we know kilowatt hour is 1 kilowatt hour is called 1 unit of energy typically 160 revolutions per kilowatt hour or so on. Okay. Now, we also saw that when we started learning the uh, principle of operation of the induction type energy meter, we assumed that if I apply a voltage a sinusoidal voltage V, then I will have a current I which would be proportional to the voltage and lag the voltage by 90 degrees. All of us know that in a practical case it is not a pro proposition that would work if I have this is the V phasor then the I V phasor the current taken by the uh, voltage coil and hence the flux would not be in 90 degrees right. So, I V comma phi V. So, this we solve by taking a branching of flux or we call it as there is a main flux I call this as phi V and this is phi shunt right. So, we 
split this flux into two such that phi v phi disk the di the flux that goes through the disk we call it as phi disk right in the last class and the phi shunt combined together of, uh, of course, should come from the total flux generated by the voltage coil. By adjusting the magnitude of the shunt flux, now I can make phi d exactly subtend 90 degrees. Right? So, <coughs> there would be an adjustment on the shunt coil flux, there will be a small screw which adjusts the reluctance of the shunt path and hence change the shunt flux. So, if we look at it, there are two adjustments already now. One is the power factor adjustment, right, which makes it, which ensures that the uh, flux produced by the voltage coil is 90 degrees with respect to it. The second is the permanent magnet itself. Right. By moving the permanent magnet in and out, I can change the torque generated by the permanent magnet, because torque is nothing but the force into the distance between the center of the disk and the center of the permanent magnet. So, there would be one more adjustment where the permanent magnet is moved in and out and hence the breaking torque is changed and hence the full scale is changed. Right? So, we can change the full scale if let us say if it is 120 revolutions per kilowatt hour and suddenly you find that it is only giving 1. 15 revolutions per kilowatt hour, then you can slightly push the permanent magnet inside. So, the breaking torque reduces and the number of revolutions per kilowatt hour increases. On the other hand, if the number of revolutions per kilowatt hour is more than what is required, we pull the magnet slightly away to the periphery and the torque generated will increase, decreasing the steady state omega. Right. So, full scale adjustment, power factor adjustment. Now, there is one more adjustment that is normally required, again that comes because of the uh, non-ideality or practical things. When I have a mechanism like this, which two pivots and the disc rotates, right. <coughs> if I look at the uh, torque versus speed of the disc, I will get a characteristics like this. If I start applying torque, for some torque, I call it as T f, up to some torque the disc will not move. Right? I mean this is uh, very, very uh, apparent to everything that is mechanical. Right? You want to push your motorcycle or a bicycle, right? you start pushing only after you were able to overcome the friction offered by the bicycle, you can start, uh, you can really make it move. Once it moves, you see that it is much more easier to push. So, the same thing will occur here, because it is also a rotating mechanism. So, we have a dead zone, where however much torque I have in that range, it is not going to make the rates disc rotate, which means if I am drawing current which produces a torque less than this would not rotate the disc. So, it is possible that I can keep drawing very small amounts of currents and the energy meter will not register any energy consumed. Right? So, <coughs> to overcome this, there is another adjustment on the uh, energy meter. We have a small protrusion from the voltage coil pole, right, just when it uh, uh, comes very close to the disk. Right. And uh, we adjust this to generate another flux, we call this, I call it as phi c, right. there is phi d itself is now split into two phi c and phi d. Right. The if I look at it now, I have two fluxes generated by the same voltage. I will have 
two currents right and uh, these two fluxes will not be in phase there will be a small phase difference and hence there will be a small force generated because the uh, additional flux eddy current due to the additional flux will react with the disk flux and so on and vice versa right and uh, we again adjust it such that the force that is generated the torque that is generated by this extra protrusion is exactly compensates for this so if i look at it if i look at torque versus uh, omega it starts at zero it doesn't start at zero because i have, we have already given a small push right due to this arrangement uh, <coughs> Normally, what happens is the manufacturer adjusts it for the meter that he makes, okay, and then he gives the uh, instrument for usage. And uh, what will happen when the, I have a rotating system and it goes on a usage? Any rotating system, when we start using, uh, initially gets reduced friction because. The, the, these two things will wear each other out and then I will have reduced friction. So, after some time the friction that is required and the torque due to the friction will reduce. So, this is after tau f after let us say one year, one year of operation, but the adjustment given by the manufacturer is tau f right the friction the uh, result is even if i have zero current just by applying the voltage there is a torque that is more than the friction torque and what will happen is the disc will start rotating slowly because this is all small quantities they will rotate very very slowly right so this phenomena where the frictional torque adjustment is not exactly equal to the required friction torque right is known as creeping we say the disc creeps right slowly and the adjustment itself is known as creeping adjustment even though it is not meant for adjusting creeping it is for meant meant for adjusting the friction offered by the rotating system uh, because of this phenomena the screw that here would have a creeping adjustment. So, if I look at it there are three adjustments on the energy meter the full scale adjustment also known as uh, uh, magnitude adjustment second is the power factor adjustment third is creep adjustment the adjustment that we need to do for compensating the friction in the rotating system okay the <coughs> counter itself initially they just put divide by 10 divide by 10 divide by 10 gears and then if you look at really old meters you have the uh, arrows pointing to 1 2 3 4 5 like that right later people really brought in a digital counter so in a digital counter we have a disk and then we have 0 1 2 9 8 written on it something like this and uh, when it goes to 9 to 0 there is a small protrusion right and the next disc is also let us say 1 2 3 etc okay now when it goes from 9 to 0 at that point only the there will be a mating gap here so it will engage so when it goes to 9 to 0 it will just move by one step 
when again goes through 9 to 0, it will move one step. So, if you look at it, the first wheel will be turning one full turn, which means I have uh, counted 10, right. Then the second wheel will turn 1, right. Again, the first wheel uh, turn 10, count 10, and the second wheel count. So, I will show you a, a physical counter, right, uh, which has been uh, broken open. Uh, then you can really appreciate how this mechanism. <coughs> With this mechanism, we put a window here, we can get something like this. The reading is perfectly here. Uh, for some reason, even though this is not a digital, right? Digital means 1 or 0, right? Uh, this is still analog, it, the yield goes through a very smooth motion. Right? Uh, people call this as a digital counter and uh, the actual disks indicating with arrows were called analog counter in the olden days. <coughs> now, the induction type energy meter was so good, right, it survived for almost 120 years without any big change, right. If you look at what the whatever the manufacturers did 120 years back and whatever uh, they are doing now, most of these uh, meters are going out of use, uh, mainly because we have, we started using lot of electronics in power systems as well as in instrumentation, right. Uh, in an electronic energy meter, we will have a multiplier. this gives me x into y and an integrator, a voltage control oscillator and a counter. Right. We now look at it, if I give a signal proportional to i here, a signal proportional to v here, I will get v i here, I will get integral v i, which is nothing but the power. From the power to the frequency, we had all these mechanisms, right. Now, in an electronic energy meter, the power to frequency is simply given by a voltage control oscillator the oscillator frequency is determined by the input voltage. So, if uh, I have 0 volts, it will give DC, if I have 1 volt, it may give 1 hertz, if I have 2 volts, it may give 2 hertz. I am only just giving you an example, right, it may not be. And then the integration of uh, the output of the oscillator is again done by the counter, it is uh, an electronic counter counts once again the number of cycles per second, right. In this case, the, the counter here counted the number of rotations per second. In that case, it will simply count the number of cycles per second of the frequency output of the voltage control oscillator, right. And many of these parts are now done in the digital domain, right. Some manufacturers give you a single integrated circuit, which will have house all this, right. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, multiplier itself, uh, major low cost electronic uh, energy meters use, they still use analog multiplier. We will talk about analog multipliers a little later when we talk about other instruments. Uh, but some manufacturers also give directly convert the voltage and current in terms of digital and then do a digital multiplication inside. Now, whatever we do, we see that the meter, right, is a single phase meter, right. It has only one voltage and one current, right. So, we call this as a single phase energy meter, okay. And uh, all of us know power 
right, so it is distributed in three phase, right. So, you can use three single phase meters if it is a three phase four wire system, right, or we can use just two single phase meters if it is a three phase three wire system, because in a three phase three wire system the total energy total power can be computed using only two lines, right. The third line automatically becomes the sum of the other two lines, right. The moment neutral current is 0 or there is no neutral, two meters are adequate, right. And manufacturers did that, they put in one meter itself two disks, right, and then put a common stem, right. So, if they, if I have one disk here, another disk here, I have one voltage coil here, another voltage coil here, right, and then I put just one common counter, right. So, the total power is W 1 plus W 2, where W 1 is power on R line and W 2 is the power on B line. So, if I symbolically represent I have this is R Y B R Y B. I have mains here, three phase mains. This is load here. So, this is meter 1, this is meter 2 and I know to find the total energy I have to add the readings of meter 1 and the meter 2. But instead of putting separate meters, we combine the disks of the meter on one central spindle, right. And the total torques exerted on the spindle will be the torque generated by disk 1 and the torque generated by disk 2 which means the total torque would be this torque generated by T D 1 plus T D 2, which is nothing but the total power in the system. So, now the counter will give you total energy, you do not have to add M 1 and M 2, one counter. So, if we have such a meter, those meters are called two element watt meters. The summing of uh, power and hence summing of energy is done by the mechanical system. And two element watt meters can be used only on three phase three wire systems or you have neutral current 0. If it is a balanced three phase four wire system, I still get the same condition that the third line current is the sum of the other two line currents. If it is a three phase four wire system, which means I also have a neutral between the connected between the main and the uh, load, right, and there is an appreciable neutral current, we need to put a three element voltmeter, right. If that is the case, this is for three phase three wire system. three phase four wire system, we need to have three such disks and three voltage coils, three current coils and of course, one permanent magnet would do any one of the disks, you can put the permanent magnet and generally that is done on the central disk that would compensate. So, for a three phase four wire system, you need a three element watt meter energy meter. This is true whether I have an induction type of energy meter or an electronic type of energy meter. This is 
the electronic okay let's uh, quickly recapitulate the induction type energy meter is so universal right if you want to measure energy on uh, ac systems for the last 120 years people used only induction type energy meter slowly that's changing we are using uh, more and more electronic type energy meters right uh, for various reasons the accuracy obtainable from an induction type energy meter uh, is not as good as the one that you can get from an electronic type energy meter, right. Especially uh, the where we keep the multiplication in the analog domain, it is easy to get uh, accuracies very, very high, right, 0.01 percent or even better. Basically, an energy meter is geared or in principle operates on a single phase. It is possible that we can combine parts of the energy meter right, either in the electronic domain or on the induction type meters into making one single meter suitable for three phase system. Right. If I combine two of them, then I have to make the voltage circuit capable of handling the line voltage and we call that as a two element watt meter. If I have three meters, then the central point always go to the neutral and the voltage coils of such three element energy meters would be designed for line to neutral voltage and not for line to line voltages. Right. Uh, the one of the problems with uh, electro mechanical type energy meter, the induction type energy meter, we saw we compared to electronic type meters is that the response time is very poor, right, because the disc rotate has to rotate and stabilize, right. If I suddenly increase the power if I suddenly increase the power, this is time, this is my average power. Let us say I go from one power level to another power level, the omega of the disk will take some time to reach stabilization. If you have very large fluctuations in power, the especially very short duration. Uh, in terms of hundreds of milliseconds. If it is tens of seconds, there is no problem. If it is hundreds of milliseconds, then the electronic type energy meter would read the correct value rather than and the mechanical elect induction type energy meter would not register proper change. We complete the uh, Uh, discussions on uh, analog indicating instruments right and we go on to the next topic the errors in measurement. Whenever we make a measurement, we should understand that 
we disturb the system. Right? For example, let me say I have ten volts and I am connecting it to a ten ohm resistor. It is VC. What is the current? 1 ampere. And of course, I do not know it is 10 ohms, I do not know it is 10 volts, right. I just want to measure current. So, what will we do? We will introduce an ammeter, right, to measure this current. Now, the ammeter is a practical ammeter, it will have an internal resistor. Right. Let me call this as 1 ohm. Now, what will happen to the current? It is going to be not 1 ampere, it is going to be 10 by 11 ampere. Right. By the very process of introducing a measuring instrument, I have changed right, the entire scenario. Without my ammeter, the current would have been 10 by 10 ampere, which is 1 ampere. Now, the because I have put an ammeter, it has changed this scenario. So, what we normally do is, we cannot avoid this. There is no way we can avoid this. What we normally do is, we ensure that whatever change we are causing by the act of measurement is as small as possible and hence we can neglect. So, in, for example, instead of 1 ohm, I have I had used an ammeter with this 0.1 ohm, this will become 10.1 ampere and we know it is going to be 0.998 amperes. Right? <coughs> okay? So, I am not making a big mistake. So, the very fact of introducing an instrument is going to create error. Because this error in measurement, right, we, we are making a mistake right, and we call this as an error. Error comes because of the system, we call this as systematic error. We call this as a systematic error. Another type of error that can creep into any measurement is the due to the instrument itself. Right? Let us take that this ammeter is a PMMC instrument, I know theta and hence my reading is B A N by K S into I. Right? Now, the manufacturer has put some permanent magnet. right? and hence has particular bay and uh, he has also used a spring particular k s. These are physical properties of devices which can change. I have a permanent magnet today, it may be producing 0 0.757 tesla and after 10 days or 10 months, right, it might change to 0 0.707, it has lost some of its magnetic strength, it is quite possible. The spring, all of us know if I start winding, unwinding, winding, unwinding, what happens to the spring? It becomes loose, it loses its elasticity right? and hence the torsion coefficient k s will be reduced. Right? So, now <coughs> because of this, even if the manufacturer gives me that theta, my reading will be exact at that point of time, these two will change with respect to time. So, after I bought the meter, 3 months down the line, 6 months down the line, the reading that I get from the meter will not be the same. If B is reducing, I will get reduced reading for my current. If K S is reducing, I will get increasing reading for the current. So, in general, if I look at with respect to time, this is my theta expected, right. 
it may start reducing and increasing something like this or it may start reducing like this or it may start increasing like this. Any type of characteristics is possible, right. What then the manufacturer does is, he looks at a one year period, right. Normally, that is what he guarantees, one year period and then he says at the one year, end of one year, the increase or decrease will not be more than certain quantity, right. So, let us assume that I have a 100 volt voltmeter, 100 volts full scale voltmeter, right. And uh, if this is 100 volts, theta corresponding to 100 volts, let us say this is 99 volts, this is 101 volts because manufacturer also does not know how things are going to go, right. It could be that his magnet is so good, it has not lost its uh, strength till the end of one year and the spring is weak. So, I got increase, right, always increase, right. Or we could be lucky that the increase, decrease in the magnetic strength might be compensated by the uh, spring, right, decrease in spring and even at the end of one year I get exact reading, right. It is it's a choice that no one, right, the chance that no one knows about, okay. So, all he can say is at the end of one year, the 100 volt volt meter, the change would not be more than 1 volt. I mean I have put it as 1 volt, he can say it will not be more than 2 volts, it cannot be more than 3 volts and so on. <clears throat> now, there is another voltmeter, let us say full scale voltage is 10 volts and that manufacturer also says that the change would not be more than 1 volt, right. At the outside it looks both are equal, right. Both are changing only by 1 volt by end of the 1 year period but they are not, right. It is a change of 1 volt in 100 volts and this is a change of 1 volt in 10 volts. It is like I am counting let us say 1001 rupee notes, I miscount it as 999, my loss is only 1 rupee. Now, I have 10 1000 rupee notes, I count it as 9 10, 10, 1000 rupee notes, my loss is 1000 rupees, right. So, this loss or this change or this error is much more than this error. For this reason, the error is always specified as a percentage, right. So, now if I look at the percentage, 1 volt in 100 volts is 1 by 100 into 100 is equal to plus or minus 1 percent. Here if I look at the percentage, this is plus or minus 1 by 10 into 100 which is equal to plus or minus 10 percent. Now, the moment I look at these two values, I know voltmeter is 1 is a much much better voltmeter than voltmeter 2. So, now we define error is equal to measured value minus true value divided by true value into 100 and the unit is percent, right. Now, when we use an instrument, right, depending upon the accuracy of the instrument, the error is called accuracy. In fact, logically speaking, if I have 1 percent error, my instrument is 99 percent accurate, right. But we never say 99 percent accurate, we always say 1 percent error, right. Accuracy is indicated in terms of error in my reading, right. And error is always given in terms of a percentage.
Now, when it comes to an instrument like an ammeter, there are two types of error, right? Error in reading error in full scale. Right. Because the manufacturer does not know what value you are going to read, right? you are having a 100 volt volt meter, he does not know whether you are going to read 92 volts or 82 volts. Right. Normally, he does not provide the error in reading. Right. Most of the instruments, the full scale error is what is specified. In most of the instruments, it is a full scale error what is specified. And the full scale error in terms of uh, uh, standardization is also given as class of instrument or we simply called accuracy class. Right. <coughs> Sometime back, this class was given in terms of class A, class B, class C, class D. Now, the manufacturers do not uh, group them in uh, numerals, they simply give in terms of number. Accuracy class 1 means the full scale error is plus or minus 1 percent. Please again note, we will come back to error in reading, we are only talking about full scale. If the meter is 100 volts full scale, then he gives what is the error when you are reading full scale. <coughs> right? If it is a 300 volts full scale, he gives the error when you are reading 300 volts on that meter and no other reading. Okay. And accuracy class is normally either 1.0 or 2.0. Right. If you recollect back, we talked about the symbols on analog indicating instrument and I, at that time, I told you there will be a number right, 1.0, 2.0 that talks about the accuracy class and that, the, that is this number. So, in the past, we had accuracy class 0 0.2, 0 0 0.5, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and 10.0. These are the accuracy classes. And as we have advanced, none of this now exists. Uh, no one would buy, at least I would not buy if it is accuracy class 3. And it is also very easy for the manufacturers today to maintain higher accuracy class than the lower ones. Okay. The 3, 5, 10 you would not see uh, today. <coughs> now, error in reading, obviously, that is what interests us. When I am reading 92 volts. I want to know how much of error I am committing, right? whether the value that I have read 92 volts is 92 volts or 91 volts or 93 volts and what kind of error that my meter is giving. Right? So, error in reading can be obtained by the red value full scale value by the value red into full scale error. Right? Error in reading So, for example, if I have a 100 volt voltmeter class 1 right, and my reading is 80 volts, it is 100, let us say it is 50 volts, it is easy for me to calculate. This is my full scale, this is my reading into 1 percent that would be plus or minus 2 percent. So, when I have a full scale of 100 volts and on that meter, I read 50 volts, the error could be as high as 
double the full scale error right on the other hand with the same meter i read a value of 10 volts then i will get plus or minus 10% this is 50 volts is red here 10 volts is red So, obviously, if I use a meter and start reading at the lower end of the scale, the expected errors could be higher, right. For a particular meter, I keep repeating this, I know, but it should go into a mind. It is not that I will get 10 percent error, I may get 10 percent error. The error could be 0, the error could be 1 percent, the error could be 2 percent. So, we call this as the worst case error. All I know is it will not be more than 10 percent, right. So, moral of the story is whenever you are going to take any measurement, it is better to take measurement as close to the full scale as possible, because you will have reduced errors. Especially if you have ranges on your meters, choose a range where you get a reading very close to the full scale. Never read at the lower end of the meter. <coughs> now, we take another example, I have a resistance to which I am applying a voltage and I am making a current flow through this, right. The resistance is uh, let us say 10 ohms and the current is 0 0.1 microampere, very small current and the voltage that I expect is 10 ohms 0 0.1 microamperes, 1 micro volts, right, 1 micro volts. So, assume that I have a meter which can read this small voltage, a 1 micro volt voltage. Now, we also know that because it is a resistor, it is going to have a thermal noise. If I look at the internal of the resistor, there are nucleuses and there are free electrons that is liberated from these nucleuses and at a particular temperature T, <coughs> right, Kelvin, these electrons will acquire some kinetic energy and they will start moving around, right. So, if I look at the voltage now, the voltage that I would get would be something like this. So, this we call it as thermal noise. right? And uh, we have a formula to calculate this noise E n square is equal to 4 k T r delta f where R is the resistance, T is the temperature in absolute Kelvin and delta F is the frequency range of interest. So, if I take a reading now, this is 1 micro volts and this could be, if I reading, I would read as 3 micro volts. Okay. So, depending upon at what point of time I am reading, I will get different readings, I will not read 1 micro volt, right. Again, I am not reading what I am expected to read that there is an error in my reading. This kind of error is known as random error. Because it depends upon when I am reading, right. If I am reading at the 1 second, I will get some value. If I read at 10 seconds, I will get some other value and so on, 
right. Random errors are normally due to nature, <coughs> right. Random errors are normally due to nature. There is another kind of error that can creep in as a random error due to interference. For example, I am trying to measure right a magnetic quantity, let us say flux, right, and somebody is kick starting the motorcycle and uh, the spark plug is quite weak and it will ra uh, radiate quite a large of amount of magnetic field. And the magnetic field that I am trying to measure will be interfered with the external magnetic field and I will write it very wrong. So, the interference and nature both can cause random errors. I will stop here, we will continue in the next class.